Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Well, you've probably seen them advertised in yogurt and drinks and dietary supplements just about everywhere. And, of course, we're talking about probiotics. Ooh, it's a good buzzword. <laughs> probiotics are they're the good bacteria that are either the same as or very similar to the bacteria that already are inside your body. And there are literally trillions, that's with a T, trillions of bacteria in your digestive tract or your gut. In fact, there are more bacteria in your digestive tract than there are cells in your body. Hmm. So you can impress your friends with that little bit of information at the next cocktail party. I sure will. (laughs) But not all of the bacteria in your body are good for you. Research suggests that having too many of the bad and not enough of the good bacteria caused in part by an unhealthy diet, can wreak all sorts of havoc on your body's systems. So how do probiotics work and how do you know what's right for you? Here to discuss probiotics is Mayo Clinic gastroenterologist, Dr. Joseph Murray. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Murray. We love having you. Thank you. (laughs) Dr. Murray, glad you're here. Because I want to ask you, is, is this probiotics thing being a little bit overdone? Well, I think we can't overdo the importance of our friends, the bugs that live in us and on us. That's essential not only for our survival, but for evolution of our human species as a species that's been able to populate all four corners of the earth. We can adapt to the the diets, to the environment, in part because of our bugs. They can change much faster than we do, and they provide us with that essential assist or support when it comes to, for example, digestion. Dr. Shives, you've been doing this program, though, for 26 years, and it's been only within the last few years that probiotics have Mm. even been a topic of conversation. When we got along fine without them. (laughs) You know, that's not true. We didn't talk about them so much, but, you know, your grandma's sauerkraut was a probiotic. If you're from Korea, kimchi is a probiotic. There have been probiotics in use for millennia. Uh, So we're not first to this game by any means, the the Chinese were using this thousands of years ago. And, and what, when you use the word probiotic, what do you what do you really talk about? Well, what about? we what? really mean in 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 is that probiotics are beneficial bugs. They're not pathogens. That means they're not things that are going to attack us and cause illness. They're good bugs that are helpful either for digestion or for our immune system. Um, and you can administer them usually taking them by mouth, and they can either be encapsulated, purified bugs that are encapsulated, or they can be food. Based probiotics. Okay, so kimchi and sauerkraut, mm-hmm. uh, any sorts of different fermented vegetables oh, that you can buy now. Yogurt. Yogurt, of course, would probably be one people are most familiar with, and there's variants of that, like kefir, for example, right. is a is another example. But virtually anything that you ferment um, has that, um, that that potential. Now, probiotic refers to live bugs. Prebiotics very similar, actually refers to food for bugs. Food that we eat, not so much intended for us as so much as intended for our bugs. That a prebiotic feeds the good bugs. So what what are those? Well, those would be things like inulin, fast. You'll find those in foods, non-digestible carbohydrates. So things that we, as the human, don't digest very well, our bugs do that job for us. And those bugs like those types. The roughage, for example, and Mm -hmm. the fiber. It's the bugs that are working on those and helping us derive the benefits that we have from eating those foods. But So the question is, though, do we need to supplement uh, our, our diet with uh, other probiotics like yogurt or some sort of pill? Or isn't the, the, the flora that we need inside our gut naturally there as a result of the, our Routine diet, normal okay. diet, so, good diet? So that's an, that's an excellent point, Tom. And I think we have done a lot to affect our bugs. And over generations, we've been killing our bugs. We've been nuking our bugs. When you take an antibiotic, a general antibiotic, yes, it's important to treat the infection. That's the bug that's trying to damage us or kill us, perhaps. But when we take those antibiotics, we're also basically declaring nuclear warfare on our good bugs. Ah, And those are indiscriminate, largely indiscriminate. And yes, we've got some resilience in our community of bacteria. They'll grow back. But it's I think it's not a bad idea to help them. And then diets, we have a very narrow diet. A narrow diet for us is a narrow diet for our bugs. And bugs need to be fed. Okay, so the prebiotic, I'm going to have to research a little bit more Mm -hmm. about that. But how do you know 
if the food that you're eating or the supplement, the pill that you're taking is a good pre or probiotic or is just something that's jumping on the bandwagon and slapping the word word probiotic or prebiotic on it? So the first thing is these are not regulated as drugs, for example, by the FDA. They're not required to show efficacy. That's, you know, do they work for treating diseases or symptoms by and large? So you're based partly on reputation. What's the reputation of the manufacturer? To have they published research, for example, on the use of their bugs? And just as you said, anyone can jump on that bandwagon and start manufacturing bugs pretty much anywhere. And that is a little scary. Yeah. Um, generally, things like foods, like yogurts, for example, you can taste them, um, you can look at them, and those tend to be generated in larger batches. So it's, I think it's a little easier to identify those as, as foods. It's when they start putting things in capsules or powder form then you wonder, well, how good were those bugs to begin with? Mm-hmm. But they are live bugs in those capsules? The intent is that they are live bacteria. Have you um, checked it out? Um, you is can grow true? them. You can sure <laughs> grow them from there. They're dried. They, they, some of them have to be refrigerated, for example. Others work, they're called lyophilized. That means they're freeze-dried, but they will reconstitute. Bacteria, well, not all of them will come back to life, but most of them will. Hmm. And you, what about yogurt? I mean, I've... Because I've started to kind of read a little bit more about Mm. this kind of stuff. Um, Is it beneficial for me to be making my own yogurt as opposed to buying store-bought yogurt? Is there really a big trade-off difference? Well, remember, store-bought yogurt has to be transported. It has to be stored. It has to meet certain taste and texture Mm -hmm. characteristics. There's a lot of additives. And again, it depends on what you're looking at. If you're looking at a very simple yogurt, I look for myself. I would look at the ingredient list. The shorter the ingredients the list, the better I like it. So how do you make yogurt? What's in there? <laughs> you take milk and you make yogurt out of it. You got you to gotta Google it, Tom. Really? We, that'll, be, like that'll be a you recipe. Have some bugs in there, so don't you yet? can start it. My mother made yogurt, yep. and she would take a little bit of starter yogurt from the previous batch, mm-hmm. put it in containers along with whatever milk she was using, keep it at a certain temperature, allow the bugs to grow, let it grow for a few days, and you got a whole new batch of mm-hmm. yogurt. And then keep on using that that. Piece, yeah, you know? and I've got friends that say once you start doing that, you don't ever want to go back to store-bought yogurt because, of course, making it yourself so much better. Yeah, all right. We'll bring some in sometime. <laughs> you know, but I'll, listen, have the, I want to address... I don't want to try it, but I just would like to see it. <laughs> no, but you know what? But also, I want to address... I mean, you know, Dr. Shives, I'm not going to put words in his mouth, but he is a little bit skeptical mm-hmm. about the importance of probiotics. Mm. Is that fair to say? Well, I, I, taking it as a, as a supplement, okay. yes, I'm a little so, skeptical. So I do think it's important that we recognize that some of these things are not proven to be beneficial. And I would always, if a patient asks, I mean, that now is becoming a much more common conversation in the clinic room is patients, well, what about my bugs? So what I ask them, are you eating a, a, a broad diet that includes lots of fruits and vegetables, especially because those are things that bugs like. Good bugs like the fiber and residue that's present in those in those fruits and vegetables. And then are they eating very high-fat foods? Because high-fat foods might actually feed bugs that aren't so friendly to us, perhaps. Ooh, could have a problem. What about <laughs> sugar? <laughs> um, Is sugar, sugar feeding the bad bugs? We, we don't know that for sure. A lot of the sugar, if you take pure sugar, you're going to absorb most of that sugar in your upper digestive system. The bugs that really like the sugar are in your mouth, and our dental colleagues don't like that at all because you feed those bugs in your mouth sugar and those produce all kinds of acids. They damage your, your dental enamel surface. They encourage you know, uh, gingival infection, gingivitis, some nasty things like that. So sugar is not so great. It doesn't make it to the colon. We want food that has fiber that will make it to the colon and feed those bugs. Are there any patients where you have actually suggested to them that they take a probiotic? Oh, yes. And oh, who yes. would that be? So I, there are certain circumstances where it may be helpful. It may be helpful in people with um, uh kind of inflammatory disorders in the gut. Now, I would never regard a probiotic as a primary treatment for, say, somebody with inflammatory bowel disease, but it might be helpful. I also recommend it in people who have taken antibiotics, for example. The data on that is a little mixed. There may be help in certain circumstances in children with or people with um, infectious gastroenteritis. You might shorten their illness a bit with probiotics. There is mixed data, and I will say there are some studies say it's great and some that say it's not, and that may be because the actual bugs matter. What are those bugs doing? Now, 
here at Mayo, we've done research on bugs. Yeah, that's yeah, what we're, we're going to talk, talk about, about next. <laughs> it's we're like he knows short, what to do. Okay. Uh, gastroenterologist Dr. Joseph Murray, we're talking about probiotics. Time for a short break. But when we, when we come back, we'll talk to him about what Mayo is doing with regard to probiotics and the future of probiotics. These live bacteria that some people are taking every day. You're listening to Mayo Clinic Radio on the Mayo Clinic News Network. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. <laughs> and I'm Tracy McCrae. We are talking with gastroenterologist Dr. Joseph Murray. We're talking about probiotics, <laughs> and we have determined that these are live bacteria, live bacteria. They're good bacteria, and there are certain patients for whom it is reasonable to prescribe a probiotic and uh, as a supplement. And if you were going to do that, would you tell your patient uh, to uh, eat yogurt or eat these certain foods or go to the store and buy a pill? Uh, generally, I usually try to emphasize the food-based probiotics. So the yogurt, for example, for some like kimchi or sauerkraut, or and I think some of that might be ethnic preferences as well. What's so, this kim who? Kim kimchi. kimchi. Well, what, what is that? That is fermented cabbage. Yeah. And it's very it's just peculiar. Like a, well, no wonder I don't know what yeah, it is. Korean yeah, Korean sauerkraut. Yeah, it's, a, it's exactly. Yeah. And it goes down in a big earthen jar in the ground it's for pretty good. several months. And really? I'm telling you, I never thought in a million years I would like fermented vegetable salad. Oh, Tom. That's what I'll get you for Christmas this oh, year. Yeah, well, <laughs> let's never talk. mind. Yeah, we're going to skip Christmas this year. Let's mm-hmm. talk about uh, what Mayo Clinic is doing in this direction of okay. microbiomes and probiotics. Sure. So Mayo has a major initiative in the area of microbiome. And, of course, at the Mayo Clinic, our research is very much patient-focused and patient-directed. And so there are many researchers now at Mayo who are studying the microbiome. In now, what is that? That's the, oh, yeah. the flora of the... Exactly. Bacteria in our your gut. community. Think of our, in fact, the microbiome even goes beyond the gut. It's present in the mouth and our skin and basically every part of our external or even some internal surface of our body have a microbiome. So when we think about the microbiome, we think about the whole of that on the human surface. And we have many investigators who've been studying the microbiome in association with diseases and disorders, also studying the effects of particular bugs. Are there good or bad bugs? So research I've been involved with as, uh, is looking at the effect of bugs that are derived from humans to see how well they can tame the immune system. And some work that's coming out very shortly suggests that a bug t- derived from the human gut delivered into the gut of a mouse can affect the immune system far from the intestine. And so the promise of that is it, it's, this is not just a gut issue. And it's not just a gut potential. The potential for our bacteria and for good bacteria may go well beyond intestinal health. It may affect the immune system throughout the body. What I'm most interested in is can you repair your microbiome? Is there, mm. is how much research is happening in that? And I'll tell you why, you know, because as a person who went through chemotherapy and mm. took some hard hitting drugs uh, that I would imagine did quite a number on my microbiome, mm. I'm fascinated to learn more mm. about how that has affected my health in all of these years as a cancer survivor, and if it can be repaired. So I think that there, there, there are several things. So diet is a very important thing for the health of the microbiome. What are we eating? Uh, and, of course, illnesses can interfere with what we're eating. Um, so, And it's not just what we eat. It's what we're feeding our bugs. So that's one. The second is chemotherapy and all the antibiotics and stuff does do a number on the microbiome. However, as the immune system of the person changes, so also does the microbiome change. So it's a two-way street. There's this crosstalk that goes on. And it turns out the more we do, the more we don't understand. We know know we don't know about this. This It's a very complicated community. And we're only now scratching the surface on trying to understand some of the factors that influence it. Again, some of the things we've learned, feed people early try and keep food going into their digestive system. Bacteria, giving bacteria to people with a very dodgy immune system can be tricky because there there has been one experience in Europe where a probiotic, generally good, was not good in somebody with a defective immune system. So Mm. we do have to be careful about administering bugs, for Mm -hmm. example. But administering foods that encourage good bugs is generally a safer general approach. Um, but again, we're just scratching the surface. But it must be in general, whether your microbiome takes a hit from an antibiotic 
or chemotherapy that in most instances it is able to reconstitute itself. Fair? I think that's fair. It will reconstitute itself. However, with repeated hits, it can become quite depleted, and especially in what we call diversity. Diversity is the kind of the broad spectrum of bugs. And one very specific category is a condition called C. difficile colitis. And mm. we've got a group here who have stu- been studying that now for a number of years. Almost, a, It is a life-threatening and sometimes a life-taking illness that occurs in people exposed to multiple antibiotics or several courses of antibiotics. And the way that that is successfully being treated in a lot of cases is a fecal transplant. Mm -hmm. So you are taking someone else's biome Mm -hmm. and uh, amending your biome with that? That would give them an instant, and it is almost instant in effect. You give them an instant diversity, and I think it's one of the best proofs of how our good bugs, even if they're borrowed from someone else, Mm -hmm. can protect us from really bad players. I, I sort of hate to ask, but how is it that you do this fecal transplant? Oh. I, I think we've talked about this. We but, sure have. You know, oh, yes. yeah, yeah, tell, tell us. Check so the we, podcast. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we do have a whole clinic and service focused on doing this. And basically it means taking healthy stool, giving it to people um, into the colon. And then okay, it so repopulates. From below. From below, yeah, usually. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. Usually? Usually there are other protocols for from above. Pills. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No kidding. <laughs> no kidding. That's right. <laughs> and, you know, I thought that I remember hearing that the microbiome has its own genetic code. Just like mm-hmm. I have a genetic code, the, my, my microbiome has its mm-hmm. own. So when we say there's changes to a microbiome, are there changes to its genetic structure mm-hmm. as well? Yeah. So the way we assess the microbiome, one of the ways to assess the microbiome is what is what are the genes that are present and what are the genes that are being used by the bugs? And that can change. And very rapidly after taking antibiotics, that will change. It will bounce back. Mm -hmm. So that gives us a very powerful tool for understanding a very complex community. So what does the future hold? Oh, the future is almost limitless. Some people have said that human stool is the next frontier for drug discovery. Um, Our area, I mean, I, I, I use the term brug. Probiotic is kind of too weak a term, but I like the term brug, which means bug drug, is Mm. these bugs can act like drugs. Wow. Let's say that again. The human stool could be one of the next frontiers for drug discovery. Well, interesting. And it may happen right in your lab. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, bring on the Kim, was it? Kim Chi. Chi. (laughs) Bring on the Kim Chi. (laughs) We've been talking about probiotics with gastroenterologist Dr. Joseph Murray. What a pleasure to have you on the program, Dr. Murray, once again. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Still to come on Mayo Clinic Radio, how advanced directive laws vary from state to state. And later on in the program, understanding lymphedema risk in breast cancer patients. Do you have a health-related question you'd like us to answer or a topic you'd like us to cover? You can tweet us anytime at hashtag Mayo Clinic Radio or send an email to Mayo Clinic Radio at mayo.edu. Coming up, the latest health and medical news with Vivian Williams. You're listening to Mayo Clinic Radio on the Mayo Clinic News Network.